Um, Derek actually spotted something in my pocket, which I was really nicking it. Uh, because I was it. As you will know, the percussion has always come well prepared, but I forgot today, so I just, I just loaned this for a short while. All become uh, uh, apparent very soon. It gives me great pleasure. Uh, yeah, it gives me great pleasure. <laughs> I'm quite humble to be asked to speak tonight to such an esteemed gathering of proficient orators. <laughs> Those of you who know me really well will know that um, I'm a man of few words. <laughs> I believe that action speak louder than words. Having said that, I was asked earlier the, in the year to speak to a, a group of um, men at a church breakfast club. Yeah, interesting. Um, the breakfast was excellent. I enjoyed that, as I always do. And I chose to speak on faithful musicality, which aimed to chart my musical actions from teenager to present time. Now, if I tell you that the breakfast concluded around about 9 a.m. and I, I was still going strong at 10:15. Uh, you will see sure. quite clearly how actually speak out some words. But fear not, those of little faith. Tonight will hopefully be very short and hopefully very sweet. As we've heard, um, I have only belonged to the group um, for four years. Um, and I had to trawl back through your program of um, past productions to actually find that out. So I forgot. I thought it was a lot longer than that. Because I seem to be part of what you've been doing for quite a long time. Only four years. And I joined in the pantomime season. Oh, yes. oh, oh, yes. In that very short time, uh, my role within the group has changed and evolved significantly. Now it's quiz time. Name that panto. Four years ago. Four years ago. Someone's going to know this. Is that what we do? Jack of the Beans. Jack of the Beans. That's the one. And it's called. Oh, no, I've got the other one. Which part are you Little drummer boy. Well done. I've got this question to you. And it's one which I've thought about. And actually, hearing what, what's been said by Steve this evening and by all of the people who, looking at all the people who've received awards, it's actually quite, uh, quite, quite important. Why do we do what we do? And I would presume to suggest that we do what we do within the group to try and make a difference. Try and make a difference. Now I know this is somewhat of a cliche, you probably would have heard many times before, but if we start to think about it, about the group's work carefully, then there are a range of people of different ages, backgrounds, abilities, aspirations, who are always touched by our exploits. But who am I talking about? Well, there are the group members from the youngest. I'm so pleased to see a lot of younger people here this evening, which I think, um, well, I haven't seen before that many people, young people here. I think that's really important. From the youngest to the more mature people, <laughs> like myself. You mean how old? Um, <laughs> sort of. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> And of course, the people we aim to touch are the audiences that receive your productions. The wider community who uh, are affected, particularly by the work of the young people uh, in the past, in the local community. And our family members. But which of those groups do you think is most important? Is it the young people who are the future, as Steve said, of the Bols of the Drama Group? Is it the more mature members? Or is it the ones in between? It's me. 
I believe the answer to that is that it's all of those people. And I think we've demonstrated that quite clearly this evening in the awards we've uh, given out, that you receive, and in the things that you do. The young ones are without doubt the groups and neighbours for the future. But they need very careful guidance and constant nurturing in order to develop, improve, and more importantly, to become role models for the potential group members of the future. But of course, they too need to be able to look up to the more seasoned wanderers who are at the pinnacle of your acting careers. Then there are the in-betweeners, those, yeah, those specialist cheeses, those good wines, all slowly maturing into fine specimens. In reality, everyone, every single person in the group is important. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we never lose sight of that, even when times are tough or a little bit rocky. Now, whilst researching material for tonight, I, I, I came across a story which illustrates just how easy it is to become bogged down in, and affected by totally unimportant dogma and pressures that we constantly face. Please let me indulge you now to conclude, short and sweet, to conclude in a, a new take on a, a classic Brothers Grimm fairy tale, Little Red Riding or, as is described in the introduction, <clears throat> a long, short story, Little Red Ridding Wood. There was once... <laughs> there was once a young person named Little Red Riding Wood, who lived on the edge of a large forest full of endangered fauna and rare plants that would probably provide a cure for cancer if only someone took the time to study them. Red Riding Hood lived with a nurture giver, whom she sometimes referred to as Mother. Although she didn't mean to imply by this term that she would have thought less of the person if a close biological link did not in fact exist. Get the hanging on here. Nor did she intend to denigrate the equal value of non-traditional households, although she was sorry if that was the impression from Bailey. One day, her mother asked her to take a basket of organically grown fruit and mineral water to her grandmother's house. But mother, won't this be stealing work from the people who have struggled for years to earn the right to carry out, carry all the packages between various people in the woods? Red Riding Hood's mother assured her that she had called the union secretary and had been given special compassionate mission exemption to carry out the task. But mother, aren't you oppressing me by ordering me to do this? Red Riding's Hood mother pointed out that it was impossible for women to oppress each other, since all women were equally oppressed until all women were free. But mother, shouldn't, then shouldn't you have my brother carry out the basket, since he's an oppressor? and should learn what it's like to be oppressed. And Red Riding Hood's mother explained again that her brother was attending a special rally for animal rights. And besides, this wasn't stereotypical women's work, but an empowering deed that would help engender a feeling of community. But won't I be oppressing Grandma by implying that she's sick, and hence unable to independently further her own selfhood? But Red Riding Hood's mother explained that her grandmother wasn't actually sick, or incapacitated, or mentally disabled in any way. Although, that this was not to imply that any of these conditions were inferior to what some people call health. Thus, Red Riding Hood felt that she could undertake the idea of delivering the basket to her grandmother, and so she set off. Many people believe that the forest was a foreboding and dangerous place, but Red Riding Hood knew that this would be an irrational fear based on cultural paradigms instilled by patriarchal society that regarded the na natural world as an exploitable resource, and hence believed that natural predators were in fact intolerable competitors. Other people avoided the woods for the fear of thieves and deviants 
but Red Riding Hood felt that in a truly classless society, all marginalised peoples would be able to come out of the woods and be accepted as valid lifestyle role models. On her way to Grandma's house, Red Riding Hood passed the woodchopper and wandered off the path in order to examine some flowers. She was startled to find herself standing beside a wolf who asked her what was in the basket. Now, Red Riding Hood's teacher had warned her never to talk to strangers, but she was confident in taking control of her own budding womanhood and chose to dialogue with the wolf. She smiled, I'm taking my grandmother some healthy snacks in a gesture of solidarity. The wolf said, you know, my dear, it isn't safe for a little girl to walk through these woods alone. Red Riding Hood said, I find your sexist remark offensive in the extreme, but I will ignore it because of your traditional status as an outcast from society, the stress of which has caused you to develop an alternative and yet entirely valid world view. Now, if you'll excuse me, I would prefer to be on my way. Red Riding Hood returned to the main path and proceeded towards her grandmother's house. But because his status outside society had freed from slavish adherence to linear Western-style thought, the wolf knew of a quicker route to Grandma's house. He burst into the house and ate Grandma, a course of action affirmative of his nature as a predator. Then, unhampered by rigid traditionalist gender role notions, he put on Grandma's clothes, her night clothes, crawled under the bed and awaited developments. Red Riding Hood entered the cottage and said, Grandma, I have brought you some cruelty-free snacks to salute you in your role of wise and nurt nurturing matriarch. The wolf said softly, Come closer, child, so that I might see you. Red Riding Hood said, Goodness, Grandma, what big eyes you have. You forget that I'm optically challenged. And Grandma, what an enormous, what a fine nose you have. Naturally, I could have had it surgically augmented to help my acting career, but it didn't give it to such societal pressures, my child. And Grandma, what big, very big, sharp teeth you have. The wolf could not take any more of these species sewers, and in a reaction appropriate to his accustomed media, he leapt out of bed, grabbed the red riding hood, and opened his jaws so wide that she could see her poor grandmother cowering in the belly. Aren't you forgetting something? Red Riding Hood gravely shouted. You must request my permission before proceeding to a new level of intimacy. The wolf was so startled by this statement that he loosened his grasp on her. At the same time, the woodchopper burst into the cottage, brandishing an axe. Hands off! cried the woodchopper. And what do you think you are doing? cried the Red Riding Hood. If I let you help me now, I will be expressing a lack of confidence in my own abilities which would lead to poor self-esteem and lower achievement scores on university entrance exams. Last chance, girlie. Get your hands off that endangered species. This is a police raid, screamed the woodchopper. But when Red, Little Red Riding Hood nonetheless made a, a sudden motion, he sliced off her head. Thank goodness you've got here in time, said the wolf. The brat and her grandmother lured me in here. I thought I was a goner. No. I think I'm the real victim here, victim here, said the woodchopper. I've been dealing with my anger ever since I saw her picking those protected flowers earlier. And now I'm going to have such a trauma. Do you have any paracetamol? Sure, said the wolf. Thanks. I feel your pain, said the wolf. And he patted the woodchopper on his firm, well-padded back, gave a little belch and said, Do you have any rennies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let us not let us not lose sight of what and what why we do what we do in bowls over drama because it leads to good things and long may it continue. Thanks very much.